One of the pieces of advice that uh, people who teach preaching give to their uh, students is that they ought to talk about these readings that are particularly difficult because it's sort of like the elephant in the room and everybody wonders what to do about t chopping off your hand and you're taking, pulling out your eye. Um, well, I'm not going to talk about that today, so I think you can come back in three years and I just <laughs> might not, might. There, there are other biblical stories that are just so good that you can't help but uh, preach on them, and I think this story from Numbers is one of those remarkable stories. Now, this ancient story uh, is clearly pre-modern, but I think it is very relatable. Although the story doesn't sound like uh, uh, our own era, it nonetheless res resonates with our lives. As we read the story, and after I've finished reading the story, I've said numerous times, yep, been there, done that. The story begins this way, according to Eugene Peterson in his Message Bible, the riffraff among the people had a craving, and soon they had the people of Israel whining. Why can't we eat meat? We ate fish in Egypt, and got it free to say nothing of the cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. But nothing tastes good out here. All we get is manna, 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 and maybe you're old enough to remember spam, 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 spam. I, I find it interesting that there's a small group of people who are causing everybody to whine. Been there done that. And I also think it's very interesting that it's food that causes the whining. Been there, done that. You want to get people worked up, mess up, mess with their food. Put them at the end of the line for the potluck. <laughs> I have to tell you, I don't think I experienced more anger in my life than the time back, it was back in Toledo, because you folks just never do this kind of thing, but it was back in Toledo and uh, a woman with I don't know how many kids she had, but loads of them uh, did not get to go in, in the front line for the dinner that we were having for our neighborhood block party. And she had all those kids, and she just reamed me out because they had to wait so long. Mess with people's food, and you'll mess with stuff that really matters to them. I had a young woman in my office the other day who told me that she quit working at a local restaurant. She did for many reasons, but a primary one, she said, was that too many people think they are entitled. Wow, I've heard that critique from older people, but this was a 24-year-old woman. Here was a young woman who got tired of putting up with people whining about their food. And this is where Moses precisely finds himself today in our numbers reading. He, the leader, is overwhelmed with the whining that is taking place among his people. And truthfully, his leadership is being called into question. And this is where I want to get to today because I think in many ways our texts for today are, are all about leadership. Moses is the leader and is feeling the weight of his people's critique, their protest about food. And by the way, I don't think we can call the Israelites entitled. Oh, that all of us longed for leeks and cucumbers and melons and a little less manna. But still, Moses, the leader, is overwhelmed and Moses the leader becomes vulnerable today. Why have you treated me so badly, he says to God? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay all the burden of all this people on me? Did I create these people? Did I give birth to them? Did I breastfeed them? How am I supposed to come up with food for all of them to eat? All the meat that they want. I am not able to carry this people alone for they're too heavy for me. If you're going to treat me this way, God, you might as well just put me to death now. Save me from the misery of having to hear people whine all the time. Ever felt overwhelmed? 
Ever felt a little self-pity? Been there. Done that on more than one occasion. And no, Moses is the leader. Sometimes leaders can feel self-pity. They can feel overwhelmed. Now, truthfully, I think self-pity looks ridiculous on us sometimes. It looks ridiculous on Moses as he says he'd rather die than have to put up with whining people. But let's not stop there. Overwhelmedness is real. Yeah, it's true. Sometimes we just need to get a grip on things. And without a doubt, sometimes we overreact. But being a leader, whether that be at church or at school or in the culture or at your home, sometimes is a big-time responsibility. And being responsible sometimes is overwhelming. Many of us during the pandemic have learned this the hard way. So many decisions have had to be made. So much change had to be implemented. So don't be surprised that leaders, don't be surprised that you are overwhelmed and feeling a little sorry for yourselves. What's more, if Moses is the consummate leader, and much of the Bible thinks that he is, maybe we shouldn't spurn the self-pity and the overwhelmness that leaders can experience. You see, grace also prevails for leaders. Good leaders can be honest. They can be vulnerable. They can say sometimes, this is too much. I can't do it by myself. Moses, as he's leading the people, is bold enough to lay it on the line with God. His relationship with God is secure enough that he can presume upon the relationship. You, God, gave me more than I really bargained for. So help me out. And guess what? God responds to his cries. And the response is not, well, Moses, get over feeling sorry for yourself. A response sometimes I think is appropriate. Sometimes we just need to knock it off. Sometimes we overstate things. Take ourselves and life entirely too seriously. I've been there. I've done that. But in the Numbers stories, this is not God's response to Moses. In this text, God is gracious. God simply says, well, let's see what we can do about the problem. And what he does about the problem is to seek help for Moses. He calls 70 of the elders of the people together and takes some of the spirit that had been given to Moses and places that spirit on the 70 leaders. The idea is that the leader has been bestowed, Moses has been bestowed with a big portion of the Spirit of God, and now some of that Spirit is going to be shared with others. Why? So that together they can lead. Moses has got some help now. The burden isn't simply on his shoulders. Good leaders can't do it on their own. And my wife will tell you that this is a place where one of my faults makes itself known. I, you know, I probably learned this well from the upbringing I had, but I do too much on my own. And I've probably gotten points in my life from myself for accomplishing a lot on my own. And what's more, I say which I, something which I'm sure you never ever say, Sometimes it's just easier to do it by myself. Getting others involved, frankly, is a lot of work. But good leaders, nonetheless, will look to others for support. Leaders need others because, let's face it, not only is there too much to do for a Lone Ranger approach to life, no leader is indispensable or will be around forever. Eventually, Moses is going to die, as will all leaders. Good leaders share burdens, recognizing their own limits and also the truth that others have gifts that will bless the whole community. Sometimes, as Paula pointed out in the children's sermon, sometimes you're going to be surprised by who those others are. 
And that's a part of the point of the Numbers story and really the Gospel reading for today. Two men in, in Numbers, I love their name. If I had more kids, I think I'd name them this. Eldad and Medad had received a portion of Moses' spirit, but evidently they hadn't shown up for the official meeting, the official meeting that gathered all the elders together. They start prophesying, that is speaking in the camp, and Joshua, the assistant to Moses, wants to stop them because, well, they don't have the right credentials and perhaps also could be perceived by Moses as a threat to him. But Moses is not threatened. Good leaders are not threatened by other leaders who are doing good work. Good leaders welcome the Eldads and the Medads of the world, the people who are casting out demons in the name of Jesus, even though they are not following the disciples. Just because someone or a group of someones are not a part of our club does not mean that they are not doing good things and assisting us in the work that all of us are doing together. And by the way, you should know that the disciples who are all worked up because of the demon-casting efforts of some foreigners are the very ones who weren't able to cast out demons themselves just a few verses earlier in the Gospel of Mark. Can you say a little jealousy? Been there. Done that. Moses' response to the non-card-carrying prophets is not jealousy, but rather, would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would his, put his spirit on all of them. Good leaders welcome other leaders. In fact, they long for everybody to take on leadership roles after all. And, and this is something many of you don't trust. All of us, all of us come gifted all of us have a role to play. All of us, in one way or another, are called to be leaders. i got to tell you, in my 30 years, 30-some years of parish ministry, I have never heard, as often as I hear right now, yeah, you know, I'm probably willing to help with that, but I don't want to lead it. And frequently I wonder, why is that so? Why is that being told, spoken so often now? Well, there are many reasons. Uh, many of us are busy, super busy, I get that. And uh, we in this culture think more and more about our individual and our family lives rather than our communal lives. And we this day dismiss and make fun of leaders. We have developed, and we've also developed such a specialty mindset that we think in no way could we be leaders in areas that we haven't specialized in. There's probably a multitude of reasons why, why uh, we don't want to lead, but hear this. Many of us who do lead are like Moses saying, oh, oh, that the Lord would put his spirit on all of God's people. And I have to tell you, this is particularly true right now. Many folks right now are checking out of leadership roles in the church and probably in the culture as well. Yet these new days will necessitate good leaders who will help the church move courageously into an unknown future. What we are about the Bible calls it the kingdom of God, the reign of God, the high way, as our theme suggests, will require leadership. No, not bossy leadership, not leadership that excludes, not leadership that's about building up our little clubs, but leadership nonetheless. Leadership that is vulnerable. Leadership that is willing to cry out to God. Leadership that is collaborative that is, working with and trusting the gifts of others. Leadership that is not threatened by others and their successes. Leadership rooted in grace and yet focused on following Jesus. The one who, by the way, in the Gospel of Mark is heading toward the cross. Leaders shaped by Jesus, will be leaders shaped 
by his cross. Amen.